Welcome back to the Perlerworks channel. My name is John. Every once in a while, my wife makes it to the top of my to-do list, and that's what this project is. She is a pharmacist and over the years has collected a number of little items and knickknacks like mortars and pestles, things like that, and we wanted to display them in the house. So this is a cabinet that will display all of her pharmacy-related collectibles. As you can see, I'm ripping down some 8 quarter walnut stock. All of this walnut material was left over from the large apothecary cabinet I made a couple months ago. So when I ordered all of that material, I was left with three or four extra sticks and this was just enough to kind of get a good selection for this piece. I'm doing the same method I did for some of my other projects where I'm going to rip the 8 quarter stock into strips, flip those over and then glue up the panels and what that gives me is some nice stable quarter sawn panels. The cabinet is about 32 inches tall, 18 inches wide, and 10 inches deep. So I'm getting these panels ripped and cross cut to those dimensions before cutting some joinery with the Domino XL over at the workbench. Now I'm using the Seneca small cutter adapter as well as the Domashim which allows you to center on imperial thicknesses much easier and use the smaller cutters. I'm also going to point to some spacers here which I'll link in the description below. And these allow you to plunge more shallow than the Domino XL necessarily lets you. It's made for thicker material, but if I have these little spacers here, I can plunge much shallower without blowing through the other side of the material. With the outer case put together, I can then cut the mortises for the middle divider, and I have a spacer made out of MDF here that's just butted up against the side of the panel, and I'll do that for the top and bottom so that everything is spaced evenly. Now I want this divider to be set back about an inch or so, so what I do is I cut the mortises with the panel at full width and then I'll come back to the table saw to rip that strip off and now you can kind of see that that middle piece is set back about an inch from the front edge of the cabinet. The bottom left portion of the cabinet will have three drawers so I need to route some dados to hold dividers which will then hold the drawers. I have an MDF spacer referencing off the bottom edge of the case piece with a pattern bit in the router running along the spacer. I can then use the first dado as my new reference for the second and so on for the third. These are stop dados, so I do need to stop short of the front edge, and with the middle panel being set back an inch, like I mentioned earlier, there is a little bit of math involved to make sure everything lines up correctly. I can then plane down the divider material so that it has a snug friction fit in the dados. And you can see one of the dados on the bottom portion of this piece. I made a little bit of an error, but that'll be hidden when the drawers are in place. Next, I cut the dividers to the correct length at the crosscut sled, and then after that I can bring out the other crosscut sled to cut the haunches in the dividers. Now, this is because I have the stop dado, so I have to cut a small portion out so that those fit up against the front edge of the cabinet. The rest of the cabinet will be open storage, so I'm going to cut four different sets of shelf pin holes so that these shelves are adjustable. Moving over to the door, I brought out the dowel max to join the rails and styles. The two rails will have a detailed curve added using a template I cut out on the CNC router. I trace the curve, rough it out at the bandsaw, then use a flush trim bit to clean it up. This is a really old bit and probably the last time I'll be using it. It did not leave a great finish, but some sanding cleaned it up well enough. After a little bit of sanding on the door and the cabinet, I could move on to gluing up both pieces. For the cabinet, I did do some pre-finishing on the parts of the cabinet that would have drawers because I knew that would be a tight spot to finish later on. The glue up is fairly straightforward, just adding all my dominoes and glue. I did tape off these joints so that I could minimize the annoyance of squeeze out later on. After the main cabinet glue up was dry, I could install the dividers. I added glue to each dado and then slid the divider into place. 
I did throw some clamps across these joints just to make sure that all the glue surface were closed nicely. Switching gears, I can start focusing on the drawers. I gave my wife the options of curly maple or white oak for the drawer fronts, and she ended up going with white oak. So I did have enough curly maple here to use for the sides, so that's what I did. I got this material roughed out at the bandsaw and then moved over to the joiner and planer to get things milled up. In situations like this, on a small project, I like to go with drawer sides that are 3 eighths of an inch thick, and then the fronts are about 7 sixteenths. Like most of my projects, I'll be using a half-blind lock joint for the drawer joinery. I've done a video on this in the past, so I'll leave a link to that right now. But in short, the most critical aspect of this joint is the fence location in relation to the thickness of your blade. You want the two of them to sort of equal each other with a little bit of space so that you can fit the joint together. I do a series of test cuts with scrap material of the same thickness just so that I can dial in the, that fence location, find a nice snug fit, and then move on to make all the cuts. I've been asked why I don't use the same joint for the back of the drawers as I do for the front, and the reason I use just a simple dado for the back is because it leaves me a little bit of material in the back to dial in the fit of the drawer. Uh, I don't usually put a drawer stop in, I just want them to butt up against the back panel, so if I am off with my calculation, I can just trim the back off a little bit so that everything is nice and flush up in the front. My new technique for fitting drawers is making a few light passes over the joinder. These drawers needed a little bit taken off the sides as well as the bottom. And for the bottom, I make a plunge cut like you see here so that I don't affect the front end of the drawer fit. I can do that by hand afterwards, which gives me a snugger fit. I used a rabbiting bit to cut a rabbit in the back side of the door, which will house the glass. I'll get into that a little bit later, which was its own little adventure. But moving on to the hardware, I can mark out the mortises for my hinges. These hinges, along with the knobs that I use, were from Horton Brasses, and they are really high quality, and it's the first time I've used them, and I'll definitely be going back for more. Uh, I used the table saw to hog out most of the waste on the door mortises, and then I cleaned them up with the chisel here. And then you'll see afterwards for the mortises in the case piece, I use a router to hog out most of the waste. A bit of an oversight on my end, but I didn't have enough room for the router to get over to the edge of the mortise, so I had to hog out more of that waste with the chisel than I was expecting, but everything ended up looking good enough at least for the hinge to be in place. I also didn't have enough room for my chisel to really get in there because the middle panel was sort of in the way so I had to keep that chisel at an angle whenever I had it in the vertical position. I got the door hung on its hinges for the first time and it was a perf- no it was not a perfect fit so I was a little bit too wide, so I had to rip about an eighth or so off that left side. The right side gap was nice, and the top and bottom gaps were pretty good as well, and they were nice and square and even, so I just had to rip a little bit off that left side, and the difference in width on those two styles is not very noticeable at all. All right, let's talk about the glass for this door. First and foremost, I did not cut myself at all. I know it looks like I'm handling the glass poorly, but that's just how I saw people doing it on YouTube, so I, I tried it. Second and second most, uh, I know I could have cut a rectangular res recess in the back of the door and avoided uh -oh. the curved glass altogether. Woo. That was plan B. Plan A was to cut the curves in the glass and then hold it oh, in no. place with some decorative trim. As you've seen, I had my fair share of mistakes. The point in the middle was the real issue, so I started to round off that area and eventually rounded the point on the inside of the door to compensate. No!
I eventually got one piece with both the top and bottom curves cut successfully. I sanded the curve a little bit to fit the rabbit and then once I put the glass in place, it broke. Like it just broke out of nowhere. I think the stress from the scoring may have created a hairline crack at that curve where the point used to be. Anyway, my last attempt before hiring this out was actually successful, but I didn't film it. Yo! Moving back to the woodworking portion of this project, the finish for this project was Rubio Monocoat Oil Plus 2C Pure. The finishing schedule for this, or the sanding schedule I guess, was to sand up to 220 grit, then raise the grain with water, then come back with 220 grit to knock down all of that raised grain. After that, the Rubio Monocoat goes on pretty easy. Just apply it, you don't need to apply too much, then come back and dry the surface off completely. And I think I was in a hurry for some reason because all of these shots are horrible and I did not get much footage of me finishing this cabinet. Okay, back to the door. One of the main reasons I wanted to use the curved glass was because I wanted to cover it with this decorative trim. The trim is made of curly maple to match the drawer sides and they were cut out on the CNC router. Now naturally, I didn't film this process either. Sometimes when I'm in the middle of a stressful portion of the build, I get tunnel vision and forget to film, so I do apologize. Anyway, the trim overall is about 3 eighths of an inch thick. About a quarter inch of that falls into the rabbit while the other eighth inch overhangs the surface of the door to hold the glass in place. The four pieces are mitered at the corners and held in place with some pin nails. This is a detail that was really not necessary, but for some reason, I got it in my head that it had to be a part of this build. When the door opens, it's a little design surprise that I think really takes this piece to the next level. The last few steps just involved installing the remaining hardware. Now I know using an impact driver for something like this is a bit of an insomnia, but I didn't really have a choice because doing it by hand wasn't working because there's a little bit of a crud buildup in the head of this screw from the coating process. but. In the end, it, it looks fine and it won't be noticed. So there's the door. I'm really pleased with it. It's my favorite part of this build. After attaching the knob to the door, I could also attach the knobs to the drawers and slide them into place. Well, that's it. I really couldn't be happier with how this turned out. From the quarter sawn walnut case, to the curved door and glass details, to the white oak drawers, it really is a complete piece and one of my favorites to date. A while back, I made what I called an apothecary wall cabinet. This cabinet builds on that design by adding a unique inset door as well as adjustable shelving. The material for this piece thins out as you move from the outside in. The case is 5 eighths of an inch, the middle divider a half inch, the drawer divider is 3 eighths of an inch, and the adjustable shelves a quarter inch. This is a design element I picked up from Mike Pekovich, among others. The curved glass and decorative trim is something I imagine Philip Morley executing perfectly, so I decided to give it a shot. These are some of the people in this space that I look up to and try to emulate at times. Anyway, that's enough rambling. If you're interested in seeing projects like this while they're in progress, follow me on Instagram at Perillaworks. Until next time, thanks for watching.